Robert for uh, being here today. Uh, for those of you who may have come in a little bit late and don't know who I am, uh, my name is uh, John Howe and I am Pat's son. And so uh, it is uh, my privilege to be here today to speak on her behalf and to say a few things. Um, I've been in the Navy for about 19 years and uh, during uh, uh, the middle of that time, I got out of the service and spent about eight and a half years uh, as a pastor and uh, pastor Truth Baptist Church of Yuma, Arizona and uh, enjoyed that very much. And uh, during my uh, ministerial time, spent a lot of time uh, doing both weddings uh, and funerals. And so uh, this is a little unusual in the sense that I'm doing my own mother's funeral. So I definitely appreciate your prayers and uh, that God would bless us and uh, help us to honor the memory of mom uh, while at the same time uh, magnify and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ because that's what she would want us to do. And uh, you know, some of the things uh, I'm gonna say uh, this morning uh, may, may folks a little bit uncomfortable, honestly. But I'm going to say the things that I believe that mom would want to be said because there are some things that need to be said. And um, as I read the Bible, um, I notice that as we read about the great characters of the Bible, whether it's Moses or David or anyone else, uh, God is never uh, forgetful to remind us that they were sinners just like us. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that includes you and that includes me and that includes my mother. And she'd be the first one to tell you that, whether you wanted to hear it or not. <laughs> and so uh, I'd like to start off before I read uh, some scriptures, I would like to say a few things uh, about mom, but I'd also like to recognize uh, some of the family uh, that are here. Yeah, and um, you know, it's, uh, it's a shame that uh, as we get older in life, it seems like the only time we see each other is during these types of occasions. And that's, that's unfortunate, but uh, as we move out into the world and go our different directions, and, and, and this is how life is, but uh, very glad today that uh, all of mom's siblings could be here. That is very, very special to me. Uh, Aunt Linda, you've come all the way from Florida. Uh, so glad that you're here. I wish Uncle John could be here as well, but I understand why he can't be. But uh, so glad that you were able to be here. And uh, Ron, that was, uh, that was the most wonderful eulogy I think mom uh, could have received. Uh, I think she would have been so pleased uh, with everything that you said. And, uh, and Will, we're so glad to have you here as well. So the fact that all three of her siblings are here uh, would have been very, very uh, precious uh, to her. And so, uh, of course, uh, me being here, I know, would have been a blessing. Uh, unfortunately, my sister was not able to make it. And so my son's over here recording. We're going to try to uh, get the service uh, uh, on, uh, on uh, 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 film or whatever you want to call it for, uh, for her sake. And we'll uh, try to get that uh, video to her. But I've also got uh, two of my boys here. Uh, I'm glad to have my yeah. son Joshua and my other son Joseph are here with us. Uh, Cindy's son Nathan is here. And uh, so glad to have uh, three of her grandchildren here. Yeah. Uh, I, I almost wonder if she loved her grandchildren more than she loved her children. Yeah, you. you know, uh, uh, someone said that, that the nice thing about grandkids is when you're done playing with them, you can give them back. <laughs> and so maybe that's why she liked her grandkids so much. Uh, but uh, my three daughters, uh, Ashley, Jessica, and Abigail, likewise, uh, were not able to be here today. And uh, also uh, mom's great grandchildren, uh, uh, Lizzie, and uh, also uh, uh, Bentley and uh, Kayla. And then uh, my youngest daughter uh, three uh, is three, uh, Lydia. Uh, she wasn't able to be here also. Uh, my wife just had uh, back surgery last week, and so she's unable to travel this time. So there are some folks that are not here uh, that I wish uh, were here. And so, uh, of course, uh, uh, the most important person we could have here would be James. And so James, so glad to have you here. I hear everyone else calling him Jim and Jimmy. Uh, I've known him for 30 years now, and I've always known him as James. And, and so, and, and mom always called him James. Did, did mom ever call you Jim? Okay, I, I was gonna say, I always heard to call you James. And so it seems like all your family and friends call you Jim and Jimmy and so forth. And so uh, I have to make sure who they're talking about sometimes. They, uh, they say that. Uh, what's that? She called me a few other things. <laughs> <laughs> well, all of a sudden they come short of the glory of God. Amen. <laughs> And, uh, and what a wonderful turnout uh, uh, from uh, from James's family. And I just want to thank uh, 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 Jim, Jimmy. Uh, I want to thank all of you all for being here uh, today. And I know in mom's later years, uh, uh, you folks were every bit as important to her uh, as us as her children and, and grandchildren because she got to see you more often as far as cookouts and holidays and things like that. And uh, so very grateful for, for the kindness and goodness uh, that has been extended to her down through the years. Uh, uh, through your family, James. That is, uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate it very much. All right, so I'm going to say a few things uh, about mom. And like I said, uh, a couple of these things uh, uh, might give some folks some pause as far as why I would bring up certain things. But 
I'm bringing up the things that I know that she would want brought up if she was the one that got to write the eulogy. And so I hope you'll keep that in mind. Now, I'm going to read through this because if I don't read it, uh, I'll probably never make it through if I just try to talk through it. All right, Patricia Ann Morrison, my precious mother, was born into this world on December the 18th, 1946, and departed into eternity to meet God on Christmas Eve of this year. This is very appropriate since Christmas and the celebration of the birth of her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was her favorite time of the year. Had she been allowed to choose the time of her departure, I am sure that she would have been pleased with the Lord's will concerning her homecoming. Mom was the daughter of Wilton, also known as Red, and Doris Turner. She was the third child of the four Turner kids, and like I said a few moments ago, we are so pleased to have her sister Linda, her brothers Ron and Will with us here today, as well as my Aunt Louise and my cousins as we celebrate her life. Mom gave birth to three children, Michael Allen, John David, and Cynthia Diane. Now, Michael Allen doesn't get talked about very often because that was an uncomfortable situation in Mom's life, but I know that were she here today, this service will not be complete in her eyes unless I recognized him. As a young unwed mother, she made the decision to give Michael Allen up for adoption to her best friend from high school and her husband. This was a choice that Mom regretted the rest of her life. After the adoption was finalized, Mom uh, fought to get Michael Allen back, but she lost in the court system. And although she didn't raise him, her maternal love for him never abated. A few years back, Michael Allen contacted me and asked for information about Mom. He later went to see her, and I cannot put into words how much this meant to her. I don't think that she could have gone to her grave in peace had this reconciliation not taken place. And so I'm very thankful to God for her sake how that was worked out. Mom raised Cindy and myself as a single mother. We grew up in the projects of Markham Terrace on the wrong side of the tracks in Huntington. Without a car, supported by welfare, food stamps, and government cheese. It was a humble upbringing, but Mom courageously did the best she could do with the circumstances yeah. with which she was dealt. Cindy and I never missed a meal, never went without clothes, or without a roof over our heads. Although life was a struggle, I look back on those times with fond memories. In 1986, Mom married James Morrison, Jimmy, Jim. <laughs> this coming August would have been their 30th wedding anniversary. James was a loyal, compassionate husband to her and a wonderful stepfather to Cindy and I. We are both very grateful for the blessing that he has been to both mom and to us, her children. I have often joked that James has had to have the patience of Job to put up with mom and her crazy kids. This isn't in the notes, but I'll never forget the time where I was in the bedroom at the house on Fifth Avenue, blasting my rock and roll kiss music so loud that the walls were shaking and James had about all he could take, and so he walked out the front door and went walking up Fifth Avenue to get away from Pat's demon-possessed son. <laughs> Not long after that, I think I was riding with this pastor in the back of his car, and I think I was making him pretty nervous, too. It's so bad that years later, when uh, Mom ran into my old Sunday school teacher and uh, they asked her what I was doing now, well, they t when she told him I was pastoring a church, uh, they almost didn't believe her. <laughs> And so, uh, James, uh, I haven't told you enough that I love you, and I respect you, and I appreciate you. God bless you. You've been there for Mom every step of the way, and I pray now that you can find some measure of peace and rest in this world for yourself as we wait for Jesus to return. Getting back to Mom, she was a kind, considerate, and compassionate person that would literally give you the shirt off her back if she thought you needed it. She constantly put others in front of herself, this was especially true of her children and grandchildren, but her charity extended to people she didn't even know. I lost count of how many celebrities that she mailed Bibles to. <laughs> Princess Diana was a personal favorite that she was especially fond of. Uh, she never met a stranger, and she passed this outgoing personality on to me, and as a pastor, that has served me well down through the years as far as my interactions with people. The most important thing that Mom provided for Cindy and I, however, was not food and shelter and so forth. It was her unshakable faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior. Uh, as uh, Uncle Ron's already alluded to, she grew up on Norway Avenue, and as a child, she attended the Walnut Hills Church of the Nazarene, which was right across the street. I remember Mom telling me that at around the age of 12, and Ron, you were right on target with that 12 or 13. That's, oh, that's, yes. that's what she told me, too. Uh, she told me that at the age of 12, she had a very troublesome dream. In her dream, 
The rapture of the church had taken place. Jesus had returned, and she had been left behind. She pleaded with the Lord to let her come with him, but he told her that it was too late. She awoke from her dream and went to the church the next time the doors were open. As soon as the invitation was given, she came forward and gave her life to Christ. Now, whenever the rapture did come, she was sure that she would not be left behind. Were she to die before the return of Jesus, she was now certain that she would go to be with the Lord. And this afternoon, uh, listen here, uh, as, uh, as sure as I stand behind this uh, pulpit speaking to you right this now, uh, she is rejoicing in the presence of God and looking upon the face of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Her faith in Jesus Christ had a profound impact on Cynthia and I and a major reason that both of us are Christians today. <clears throat> we would often play church in our Markham Terrace apartment. I would do the preaching, Cindy would provide the special singing, and Mom would be the congregation. <laughs> I never get, did get no tithes and offerings, though, so that thing didn't work out quite the way I thought. These initial experiences led to my later calling to be a minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as Ron alluded to earlier, uh, Mom was not perfect by any means, nor are any uh, of the rest of us. Um, like every other human being, she had her flaws. Uh, the Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, this was certainly true of Pat Morrison. Uh, she had that famous Red Turner temper, which I might add, unfortunately got passed on to me and to some of my kids. I guess that stuff is hereditary. Sometimes she could be very impatient when she didn't get her way. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind, uh, being in the, in, in the medical profession, that certainly her lifelong habit of cigarette smoking probably played a part uh, in her life being shortened over what it could have been because of breast cancer and subsequent stroke. But in spite of these things and other faults that I won't belabor, she couldn't have been a better mother to me than what she was. As I went through the trials of life, including a terrible divorce, when I lost the support and confidence of some of my dearest friends and family, my biggest cheerleader in this world was my mother. In spite of my mistakes, flaws, and sin, she loved me with an unconditional love that I am so grateful for today. She had this same love for my sister and for all of her grandchildren, yeah. and of course, her dear husband, James. This world was a better place because of Pat Morrison, and its loss was heaven's gain as she entered the pearly gates to walk the street of gold into the warm embrace of the Lord Jesus Christ on Christmas Eve to stand before the throne of God. And so those are the things that I have to say about my mother. Now, as we transition to the next part of my remarks, there's a few things I'd like to say from the scriptures. And I'm saying these things today because I know that this is what mom would want. You know, uh, when we talk about death, there's four facts of death that we can talk about. And the first one is as obvious and as plain as the nose on your face, and that's the reality of death. Death is a very real thing. As a matter of fact, today, uh, folks, right now, we are looking at death. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life yeah. through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I want you to think about that term, wages. You know, we're about to enter into tax season. 2015 is about over. All of us are going to be filling out our W-2s and going to H&R Block or, or whoever it is that does our taxes and so forth. And we are going to turn in our wages and earnings statements, aren't we? And uh, we're either going to end up owing taxes or, or perhaps we're going to get a tax return back. But when we talk about wages, um, the wages of work is money. When you work, you earn wages. Well, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. Yeah. Even as working generates a paycheck, sin generates death. Yeah. The wages of sin is death. And so we see the reality of death. The Bible says that as it is appointed unto men once to die, yeah. but after this the judgment. You see, there's an appointed time for you to come into this world. You even have a birth certificate that documents that time. But there's also an appointment with death that right now as you sit there in those seats, you don't know when that time is, but God has already foreordained it. God has already appointed it. You just don't know when it is. And after you die, there will likewise be that death certificate. Someone said one time, the only thing in life you can, uh, can't cheat is death and taxes. Well, that's not exactly true because people cheat on their taxes and they get away with it. But there are two things you can't uh, cheat. You can't cheat death. And you can't cheat judgment. As it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. Yeah. You will die, 
and you will face judgment. Thank That's you. true of every single one of us. Yeah. The question is, how will you face judgment? Because the Lord Jesus Christ will either be your Lord and Savior, or he will be your judge. And I'm glad today that I can say with every bit of confidence that I can muster up that at the age of 12 years old, my mother trusted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And although the reality of death has befallen her, I know that she's meeting him as Lord and Savior and not as judge. But sinner friend, if you sit here lost today, religious, never having truly been born again, never having truly received the blood atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to face God as your Lord and Savior. You're going to face him as your judge. And I know that mom would want with every fiber in her being for you to come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. And that's why I say the things that I say. And so we see the reality of death. The Bible tells us, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Yeah. I was talking to Aunt Linda before the service today, and I was uh, telling her that I'll be turning 47 uh, in May. And uh, I remember when I was, my son Josh's age, 15 or thereabouts, uh, if you'd said 47, uh, I would have thought you was ready to fall into a grave somewhere. <laughs> I got to be honest, 47 don't sound so old anymore, folks. <laughs> you know, uh, what is it, 50 is the new 30 is what folks are saying? Yeah, but isn't it amazing how quickly time passes by? Here today, gone tomorrow. You know, I've got a theory on that. Uh, you, when you're a teenager, it seems like time takes forever, doesn't it? You know, uh, most folks, uh, they can't wait till they turn 16. What happens when you turn 16? Get your driver's license. Oh, yeah. Then the next thing is you can't wait till you turn 18. What happens when you turn 18? Well, now you're an adult. You can vote and join the military, things like that. Yeah. And then 21. A lot of folks can't wait till they turn 21 because now you don't have to go slip the drunk five bucks at the, at the Circle K to buy you a six-pack of beer. You go buy it for yourself. And so a lot of folks look forward to turning 21. But you ever notice that after you hit 21, the milestones in life, there really aren't any. And after 21, it almost seems like, uh, in my life especially, that someone hit fast forward on my life, and I went from 21 to 46 in a New York minute. And that's exactly what the Bible's saying here. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. It's like sitting in a park and watching the cloud on this side of the horizon. You're sitting there reading the paper, looking at your phone, whatever. You look up and that cloud's right in front of you. You keep on reading or whatever you're doing. And a few minutes later, you look over here and that vapor, that cloud, it's gone. It's traveled across the horizon in front of your eyes and now it's out of your sight. The Bible says that's exactly how our lives are. Now, not only is there the reality of death, but secondly, let me say this. The second fact about death is the reason for death. The reason for death. And the reason for death, of course, is sin. Earlier I mentioned to you this verse that says the wages of sin is death. My friends, the Bible tells us that there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. The Bible tells us that there is none righteous, no, not one. If I took a poll of the room uh, and asked you to name somebody righteous that you know of that's a righteous person, there's some folks that might say the Pope. There's some folks that might say Mother Teresa. There's some folks that might say the Reverend Martin Luther King. There's folks that might come up with some person that they believe to be a righteous person, but the Bible still says that there is none righteous, no, not one. And the reason why there's none righteous, the reason why you're not righteous, the reason why I'm not righteous, the reason why my mother was not righteous is because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single one of us is sinners. And because we're sinners, we deserve to die. The Bible tells us, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You see, God gave Adam and Eve that commandment. Uh, he told them not to eat of, the true, uh, uh, eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, Eve disobeyed that, gave to her husband. He disobeyed. He partook of that fruit. And when they did, they brought sin into this world. And when they brought sin into this world, they brought death into this world. Hence, everybody that's ever come after Adam and Eve has been a sinner. And every single person that's come after them has died. You look around the room, you say, I haven't died yet. Your time's come. Friend, I don't mean to be unkind, but your time is coming. My time is coming. On Christmas Eve, my mother's time came. We're all going to die someday unless the Lord comes back first. And so knowing that the reality of death and knowing the reason for death, 
thank God, we better find out what is the remedy for death. And there is a remedy for that death. And remedy is not found in religion. It's not found in philosophy. It's not found in, uh, in the wisdom of men. Religion can't answer this question. The answer is found in a person, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. The man that wrote that was the Apostle Paul. And before Paul was converted, Paul was a terrorist. Uh, Paul would have been one of these radical Muslim type guys going around blowing up things back in his day had that technology existed in that day. But one day on the road to Damascus, the Bible says that a light shone to Paul above the brightness of the sun. He was knocked to his feet or knocked off his feet to the ground. And uh, he had a miraculous conversion to the Lord Jesus Christ. And after that, he never got over getting saved. He never got over what God did for him. And don't you ever get over it if you're saved here today. But he said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. Jesus didn't come to start a new religion. Jesus didn't come to show a better way. Jesus didn't come just to live a perfect life, although he did live a perfect life. Jesus came to be a ransom for your sin. He came to pay the penalty of your sin. The Bible says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Jesus paid your sin debt. He became the substitute on the cross for your sins. Because there was no way for you to save yourself Jesus stepped out of the glory world of, this, of the throne in heaven and came down to this earth through the crimson womb of a virgin's womb and listen, stepped into this world as God manifested in the flesh, lived a perfect life, and went to Calvary's cross and was nailed there for your sins and shed his blood to keep you out of hell. He loved you that much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. My friend, you can be saved today. You can be forgiven today. I realize many of you are here, are, are, that are here are saved, and you know the Lord. But I'm preaching for that, that one, or that two, or that three, or that four, that maybe you're not. And I realize some of you are getting uncomfortable because some of you don't ever go to church. Well, that's okay. You can thank mom for this because mom wanted you to have some church today. <laughs> mom wanted you to have some church today. Don't you think that her and I didn't talk about this down through the years? Uh, mom's been thinking about this day for a long, long time. Has she not, James? Amen. Oh, yeah. And so, uh, listen here. Mom wanted you to have church today. So I'm sorry if that bothers you or offends you. If it bothers you because someone loves you enough and cares enough about you to tell you the truth, yeah. then maybe you should check out your own heart. The remedy for death is Jesus Christ. It's not joining any church. A Baptist church, a Nazarene church, a Catholic church, an Episcopal church, a Muslim mosque, a Jewish synagogue. Uh, listen here. That's not the remedy for sin. The remedy for sin is a person. Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, died for you on the cross. The Bible says, now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Have you been saved, friend? If you haven't been, now is the opportunity. Not only the remedy for death, but last of all, let me say this. When I say last of all, if you ain't said amen yet, don't say amen now. The resurrection from the dead. In John chapter 11, I'm going to read you a portion of scripture here. It says, Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Their brother Lazarus had died. Then Martha, as soon as, he, as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me, 
shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, yeah. which should come into the world. So, the reality of death, the reason for death, the remedy for death, but last of all, the resurrection from the dead. If you read the rest of that story, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, didn't he? He said, Lazarus, come forth. Uh, some theologians have said that if Jesus hadn't qualified that by saying Lazarus, if he just would have said, come forth, that everybody that had ever died in the grave would have come forth. That would have freaked some people out. So fortunately, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. But there is a resurrection coming that's different than Lazarus's because after Lazarus was raised from the dead, guess what happened to Lazarus? He died again. He was restored to physical life, but later on, he died again. The Bible tells us about a resurrection, however, in which nobody's ever going to die again. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Folks, this looks like defeat. Does it not? Let's be honest. Does this not look like defeat? Someone lying in a coffin, dead and departed from us, and no longer with us. This looks like defeat. But it's just like in the movies, when at the last possible moment, when all hope seems lost, the hero shows up and saves the day. And my friends, Jesus Christ is that hero. Yeah, yeah. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. And someday he's going to come back to this earth. And those that sleep in Jesus Christ, he's going to rise or raise them again from the dead. The Bible tells us here in this next verse, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? That's two separate songs. See, those of us that are alive when Jesus comes that shall never experience the sting of death we're going to be the ones that sing, Oh, death, where is thy sting? But then there's going to be a second group of people, just like my mother here, that have walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And when Jesus comes back and raises them, their song isn't going to be, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Because they have experienced the sting of death. Instead, their song is going to be, Oh, grave, where is thy victory? This is not the end. This is not the end. This is not defeat. This is the first step to victory because when Jesus Christ comes back, he's not only going to raise my mother up again, he's going to raise up your saved loved ones too. And we're going to rise to meet him in the air and be with the Lord. And the Bible says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or not go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Watch this now. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You know, I got the news that mom had passed away on Christmas Eve. That's a, that's a really difficult time to lose anybody, but especially your mother. And um, I've shed some tears over the days that have followed, as you might expect. But having been a pastor, I have preached the funerals of those who were lost. Preacher, have you? With their lost loved ones? And let me say something to you honestly. 
You have never heard anything more horrific in your life than the wails, cries, and screams of those who lost a loved one when either that loved one was not a Christian or those that are left behind are not Christians. They have no hope of ever seeing that loved one ever again. And you've never heard the like in your life. As a matter of fact, I hope you never have to hear it because it's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. But my friends, I've got every bit of confidence that my mother knew Jesus Christ. And that she was the one that told me about Jesus Christ. And I would be standing behind this pulpit saying the things I'm saying to you right now exactly. if it wasn't for the influence of a godly mother who loved the Lord. Exactly. Uh, my own cousins here, John Richards, told me that uh, I believe Mom was the first one told you about Jesus. And Chris, uh, I bet you could probably say something similar and Elaine maybe something similar. And so uh, all of us, we love the Lord now. And it's, you know, of course we had to make that personal choice, but we cannot deny the influence that she had in our lives to help bring us to Jesus. Ultimately, every one of us has to make that choice. What's that old saying, Jim? You can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Now, I've heard Chuck Norris can make him drink, but I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> I doubt it, bro. I doubt it. But you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I'll tell you what Mom did. Mom brought the horses to the water, and it was up to us to take the drink. But I'm so glad that she pointed us in the direction of the trough. Aren't you? And so, as I close here today, I just want to invite you that if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you don't know 100% for sure that heaven's your home when you leave this world, I hope you'll come see me off to the side. I've got some gospel tracts here that have the plan of salvation in them. I'd love to give you, give you some literature that you could read to take home with you. And I'd be happy to sit down with an open Bible and show you how you can be 100% sure that heaven's your home. I'm willing to do that because that's what mom would want to do. As Uncle Ron said, she never knew a stranger. She handed out tracts to everybody she encountered everywhere she went. Yeah. And, uh, and God only knows uh, uh, how many folks got saved from that because the Bible says the word of God shall not return void. Right. <laughs> God's going to honor his word. Amen. He's going to honor his word today, even in the midst of those who didn't like to hear it. He's going to honor him anyway because he's holy and because he's God. And I plead with you today that if you don't know Christ, that you'll come to him as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Now, um, I'm going to sing for you, and if you think my preaching's bad, you haven't heard my singing. And uh, I'm going to be doing acapulco, acapello, or whatever you call it. <laughs> and uh, my throat's all scratching out from talking too loud and talking too long. And so you all bear with me. But uh, Mom's favorite song, <clears throat> as I understood it, was Beulah Land. Yeah. And uh, she'd always uh, talk to me about, uh, at her funeral, because like I said, she's been planning this thing since she was probably about my age. <laughs> um, she's been planning this for a long time. She always uh, said that she wanted to have Beulah Land uh, played at her uh, her funeral. And so um, I'm going to sing it for you, and y'all y'all try to bear with me, and I'll try not to torture you too much. Beulah Land, I'm longing for you. And someday on the I'll stand, there my home shall be eternal. Beulah Land, sweet Beulah Land, I'm kind of home, sick for a country to which I've never been before. No sad goodbyes will there be spoken, for a time won't matter anymore. Beulah Land, I'm longing for you, and someday on thee I'll stand, there my home shall be eternal. Beulah Land, sweet Beulah Land, I'm looking now across the river where my faith will end inside. There 
there's just a few more days to labor than I will take my heavenly flight. You la land, I'm longing for you. And someday on thee I'll stand. There my home shall be eternal. Beulah land, sweet Beulah land. Beulah land, sweet Beulah land. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come and celebrate the life of my dear mother, Patricia Morrison. And Lord, I thank you this morning or this afternoon as I stand behind this pulpit preaching and trying to honor her. The Lord, she's in your presence. She's looking upon your face. Lord, this frail shell of a body that's left behind is going to be changed when you come back. This corruption must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Lord, she's going to rise again, and she's going to sing that song, O Grave, Where is Thy Victory? Lord, thank you for my mother. Thank you for the 69 years that you gave her. Thank you, Lord, for all the lives that she's touched down through the years. Thank you for the heritage and the influence uh, that she's left for both me, my sister, my brother, as well as uh, all the grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Lord, I pray, God, that you would just uh, help us, Lord, to follow that example of that undying faith in you and that willingness to share your love with others, Lord. And Father, I pray for those that have come. Lord, I thank you especially for the family that's traveled so far. Uh, Aunt Linda came all the way from uh, Florida. Uh, others have come from Ohio. Uh, others from uh, possibly other places, Lord. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that they were all able to come. I pray for traveling mercies for everyone that has to travel to go back home. We just ask you to minister and bless their needs. But Lord, as I close in prayer, Lord, my heart goes out to any hard-hearted person here that's resisted your love, resisted your grace, and has never come to know you. Lord, I pray that mom's influence might still abound even here at her funeral, that if there's someone here that's never truly trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, thank you for your goodness and mercy. Thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the blood that washes away our sins. And thank you, Lord, for the Bible that tells us of these things. And Lord, we'll thank you, we'll love you, and we'll praise you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.